ever wondered how to build an asynchronous CCM high voltage boost Nixie power supply with a voltage multiplier? No? That means you're a normal person. Good for you. But for any other weirdos out there, here's how I built mine. Before anything else, this circuit involves high voltages, so if you're afraid of getting electrocuted or killed, don't build it. Ah, Nixie tubes. Before they became popular with hipsters, they were first built in the 50s and used in laboratory measurement equipment and other fancy stuff. Nowadays, they have been replaced by LEDs, LCDs or VFDs. Such a pity. Nixie tubes emit an amber-like glow which warms up both the room and the hearts of DIY enthusiasts worldwide. The only problem with using them in a circuit is the high voltage needed to supply the Nixies. You don't really have a 200 volt battery, so you will need to have a circuit to generate it. So let's see how you can obtain this voltage. In the early days the equipment would have a big iron core transformer with one of the secondary windings supplying this high voltage, but fortunately these transformers are hard to find these days. Now, the typical circuit that can be found on the market is a booster. Sure, if you're lazy, you can buy it and be done. But if you want to spend a week building and tweaking a circuit that might not even work at the end, then this video is for you. What I will try to build is a supply that can give around 200 volts at 10 milliamps from a 12 volt input supply, without having a heat stroke by using the NCP3063 controller. This will satisfy the needs of most Nixie based circuits. Also, I don't want any heat sinks or other large components. The supply must be small, efficient and neat. So what exactly do I need? As first stated, we need a booster. That means a DC-DC step-up converter. This is what the basic booster looks like. It doesn't look that complicated, unless you look at the mat behind it. Then the idea of buying one reappears. Must not have on pure thoughts. The first thing to do when designing a boost converter is to decide on the mode of operation. We have to choose between CCM and DCM. In short, the difference comes from the way current is passing through the inductor. On one hand it's continuously varying, while on the other it's discontinually varying, and periodically taking a break at zero. While most engineers try to stay away from DCM because of its unpredictable nature, it has one major advantage for us. The input to output voltage ratio. In CCM, it is dictated by the duty cycle. This would not be a problem if the control IC would be ideal, but for the NCP3063, we have a typical maximum duty cycle of 85%. This means that from 12 volts, we can get theoretically maximum of 80 volts, which is a bit short of the 200 we need. This is where DCM comes to the rescue. In this mode of operation, we can get any output voltage. So, a booster needs to be driven in this operating mode to be able to supply our Nixie tubes. The unpredictability comes from the multitude of parameters that come into play, as can be seen in the massive formula, from chosen components to output load, duty cycle and others. Here's what such a booster schematic looks like. Most of the components are computed based on the datasheet formulas. And here's what I built earlier, small and neat. Let's just see how it performs. The main thing that I'm interested in before anything else is the efficiency. This will tell us how much of the energy going into the supply is actually coming out of it, and how much is wasted as heat. This will be the setup I use. I got my input voltmeter and ammeter, the booster power supply of course, and the output voltmeter and ammeter. So let's start measuring. Phew, after all this data will be thrown into the spreadsheet, the efficiency will magically appear. Ta-da! Here we can see my data all plotted out. Hmm, I'm getting a maximum of around 70%. Not bad, but not really good either. So I started investigating the losses, to see what was going on, and the thing that popped out was the switch node. We are expecting a nice rectangle. But what do we actually get? Not so clean, is it? We are getting a few extra dimples. I simulated to see what the problem was, and it was not some obscure defect in my circuit. I was able to actually reproduce it. Right there. Actually, there's quite a lot of literature regarding switch node ringing. 
but the short explanation is that the gate, drain and source drain capacitance is forming an oscillator with the inductor, which end up oscillating around the 0 amp point, and this causes increased losses during the off period. The effect can be reduced by using transistors with different capacitances or adding a snubber, but in the end it would just hide the problem, the losses will still exist, and will still cause excessive heating of the circuit. It's not a fatal problem, it's actually a trademark of most supplies in DCM, but if 70% is good enough for your needs, sure, use this supply. But I am not happy yet. I want more. More power! I mean efficiency. So I started searching for a different approach. One that would keep the power supply in the CCM region. Like, why not add the voltage multiplier at the end of my circuit? The switch node already looks like a half-wave AC signal, so it should work. And staying in the CCM region will eliminate the pesky oscillations, and it should make the power supply more efficient. This is what the voltage multiplier looks like. The theory behind the circuit is that on each cycle, the succeeding capacitors are being charged from the previous capacitors. The voltage on each of them will be roughly equal to the base voltage in the circuit, but because they are all in series, the output is a multiple of the initial voltage. Obvious, really. The complete circuit would look like this. This is the booster with a times 3 voltage multiplier. Not much has changed from the previous version, except the pile of diodes and capacitors which appeared. But there is one major advantage to mention regarding this circuit. The peak voltage applied to the components. In the previous design, the transistor, diode and output capacitor would be exposed to the 200 volt output, so at least 250 volt components needed to be used to be safe. With the voltage multiplier, the output is still 200 volts, but the maximum voltage applied to each of these components is a third of the output voltage. 200 divided by 3 is 67 volts, so 100 volt components are used. This means that cheaper components can be used, or better components for the same price. Time to see if this theory actually holds up. Here's the circuit assembled, roughly the same size as the previous one. First, I must check the switch node. After all, that was the main problem the last time. Hmm. Well, it's a different story. No more ringing, or any other unwanted artifacts. Just a clean textbook square wave. Time to measure the efficiency then. I will be using the same setup as before, but hopefully I get some different data. So, got my final data here, and it's a different world. I gained more than 10% efficiency. Also, in comparison, the waste heat has more than halved. I call that a win. So, in conclusion, by keeping the booster in CCM and using a voltage multiplier, I boosted the efficiency and got close to 85%. For a booster with a times 20 voltage multiplication factor, that's a very good value. The power supply will be usable with multiple NICs, and higher power versions can easily be built if needed. Hope you got some useful information out of this, and let me know if you try to build this circuit. Leave your thoughts in the comments, and see you next time. Bye bye!